God. It's all right, praise the Lord. Not just in church, but no matter where we're at, it's all right. On the job, driving down the road, hallelujah. My boss come in on me one time. I was in the shop just sitting there working, and I was, I was singing and praising the Lord. Right now, look, no, he's just standing there looking at me. <laughs> hey, let the joy of the Lord fill our soul. <laughs> Hallelujah. They don't understand it sometimes. Praise God. Especially his church of Christ. He really comes in to shock me. Come in here. I've been talking and done. Yeah. Praise God. But, hallelujah. Nothing like, nothing like being able to praise the Lord and feel that spirit, the presence of God come down and just start taking over. Hallelujah. It's bubbling up inside of you, cleaning all the impurities of the day out of our heart. Hallelujah. I know you don't want a job, but I'm thankful for the job I've got. You know, the guys I work with profess to be Christians, they might not know all the truth, but I'm working on them. But you know, I'm glad to be working with folks I don't have to hear about all these dirty jokes and all this cussing and all this stuff going on. I thank God for it. You know, freedom. Worship God. Hallelujah. Praise my Savior. Hallelujah. Well, for a moment here, just let me please I went to see Brother Warbritton yesterday. And he was in really good spirits. He still had some oxygen in his nose. They said they wouldn't let him move from the where he was before, back to, you know, what do they call that, home health or whatever, the rehab center, really, in Parsons, used to be the golden butterfly, but uh, he was he was doing good, he said when he got there, all he could do was just stand up, that was it, for one minute, they got him walking, he can walk about 150 feet, he kind of takes it in stages, but, you know, he's getting his strength back, but uh, he was talking about when he was in the the other place, on, what was it? In the hospital. Yeah, I guess I just do it. I don't remember the name of which one it was. Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt. Okay. And uh, he was talking about that. They, they had asked him, different doctors, did you take the COVID shot? He said, no. They said, why not? He said, I don't trust it. And they never questioned him. You know, I just dropped it right there. Somebody else asked me. He said, no. He said, why not? I don't trust it. He said, I know people that have taken it. And still got COVID. And people taking the booster and still got COVID. I don't believe it works. I just don't trust it. You know, they just left him alone. But I walked in and they want you to wear a mask before you go back there. Yeah. And I go back there. Of course, the lady at the desk told me, she said, I, I know people are complaining about this. She said, I don't like it either. When I get out the door, I throw mine away. But in here, I have to go by the rules. I got back there at his room. He said, we don't wear them things in here. <laughs> but... You know, he, he was doing good. His spirits were lifted up. And while he was there at Vanderbilt, though, it was kind of sad because they actually caused him to have a heart attack. They gave him some kind of medication that caused his heart to get out of rhythm. And it was trying, both valves were trying to pump the same direction at the same time. And for six hours, he was telling them, I'm having a heart attack. We need to do something, you know. I said, you don't have a heart attack. You just need to breathe. He said, I'm not having any trouble breathing. I'm having a heart attack. For six hours, he said, I've never been in pain like that. He said, finally, he kept on. This one nurse got in his face and told him, you are not having a heart attack. Breathe, you know. And he kept on until they finally got a doctor in there. And he rushed him to the emergency room and took him in there. He said they strapped him down on the table. The doctor told him, he said, son, grit your teeth because this is going to hurt. They hooked him up with that defibrillator. and stopped his heart. He said, he's just shaking all over that table. And then when it stopped, he said, they did it again and started his heart back. And he said instantly the pain was gone. You know, the heart went back to its normal rhythm. Oh, well, that was kind of sad, but, you know, he's out. He's praising God. You know, he's able to get back in. He said he never let him put him on a ventilator. He told him, he said, I'm not going to be put on that thing no matter what. But they just kept trying to breathe. But he's doing really good now. He's in the home health care, whatever that is there in Decatur County. So they call it Decatur County Manor, but that's not what they call it on the sign. But he's in room 502 and he's glad to have any visitors that will come see him. But I praise God. You know, he's a prayer answering God. I've seen that again and again and again. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. Sister Nikki, can I get you to take up tithes and offerings? And, uh, I'm going to sing another. Will you ladies going to sing a song this morning? I'm 
don't know. I seen Sister Nikki run around the paper back there. I mean, Sister Brittany. <laughs> but I didn't know what she was planning or not. So anyway, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to sing another song. What he is is what he was. <clears throat> What he is is what he was, what he'll always be. He's open up the blind eyes and set the captives free. He's a mighty redeemer, what he'll always be. What he is is what he was, what he'll always be. You're just a sinner, indeed, turn around. Don't believe you can't be saved, but there's one thing I found. One thing
Hallelujah. Praise God. We're well, thankful for everyone who's here this morning. Praise God. Thankful for my oh boy, Brother Jeremy, Kevin, just want to take care of me. Remember to take care of the old, decrepit old man so y'all can bend over and pick up this water bottle. Come home from work the other day, had the garden tilled. Hey, I thank God for it. I don't know what's the matter with folks say, I don't want to have no children. It comes a time. They don't want to have to take care of it. It comes a time when they might be taken care of. Hallelujah. Children are supposed to be a blessing. Hallelujah. I want to be going to the book of John, chapter 3. Anybody that's read their Bible much will probably remember this setting of scripture anyway. <clears throat> but my subject this morning is the friend of the bridegroom. I want to be a friend of the bridegroom. Hallelujah. There's I got studying through all this. I, there's a lot more to this than I realized. Hallelujah. And there's a lot more in the Bible, as is many times when you start trying to study the Word, it opens up a door and it just keeps growing. <clears throat> and there's probably a lot more than I'll deal with this morning. But the friend of the bridegroom, in the book of John, chapter 3, starting at verse 25. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And I'm going to let you be seated right there. Because I'm going to read the rest of this and I'll probably be stopping and making comments. No sense everybody be standing the whole time. Hallelujah. And they came <clears throat> unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold the same baptize him. And all men come to him. Now, to be honest, in my mind, I kind of feel like this is a jab. You know, you ever work on a job and people try to make jabs at you, try to get you stirred up, get you riled up about things, you know. They say, you know, that, that one you introduced us to on the other side of Jordan there, or beyond Jordan, as they say. He also said the shoe latches, he wasn't worthy of stoop down on loose. But it reminded him, you know, the same one that you had introduced. Now, he's baptizing. He's stealing your thunder. And all men are going unto him. <coughs> Hallelujah. Even some of John's disciples. Some of the Lord's disciples. A couple of the twelve. Heard John say, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And they left. And they're trying to, to me it seems like they're just trying to rub this in. You know? Behold, the same baptizes. And all men come to him. You know? And verse 27, John answered and said, What man can receive, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. And there's a lesson here that's not really part of this lesson I guess but there's a lesson that can be learned here don't be distressed when others get more recognition than you even if it's something that you've done to bring somebody else to glory human nature wants to get upset about that but I'm the one that helped him get there yeah? I'm the one that should be getting the recognition I'm the one that should be you know having all the thunder and I, he's stealing my thunder John said, no man can receive anything except God lets him have it or be given him from heaven. So we can't get upset about things like this. And John did not let this get to him. John answered correctly. He said, ye yourselves bear me witness since you were there. When I introduced this Jesus, that I said, I am not the Christ. I'm not the one you were looking for. They came out asking him this before Jesus publicly made himself known, you know, as far as his, his ministry. Hallelujah. He said, I am not the Christ, the one you were expecting, but that I am sent before him. Now, John and, and Jesus were cousins. John was the second cousin. You know, and I'm sure growing up, they probably played together as kids. So there's more between the two of them probably than we even realize. All right? But he said, Verse 29, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. Hey, I'm not the bridegroom. 
But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because the bridegroom's because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. You think he's gonna make me mad about this? Man, I'm getting happy. And verse 30 said, He must increase, but I must decrease. Hallelujah. And we gotta realize in our walk with God that He's first. We need to lift him up. We need to make his kingdom increase. It's not, not what we get out of it. Hallelujah. We're getting much, much more than you can imagine. Praise God. But John used this illustration, <coughs> excuse me, of the bridegroom because he wanted to drive this point home about the bridegroom and the friend of the bridegroom. Okay? He was not the Christ. Or the bride, bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom. Now, I talked last week on the uh, five wise, responsible virgins. Praise God. And this is kind of, a, I guess you could say, a continuation of it, but it's also it's kind of where I got into this and started studying this out. But he was the friend of the bridegroom. Now, John was referring to an ancient custom of the friend of the bridegroom. You don't hear this just described in the Bible in the same way I'm going to describe it now. <clears throat> okay? And I never understood this custom of the friend of the bridegroom before. But it's referred to many times in the Bible. And it brings itself to light. <clears throat> okay? The friend of the bridegroom. And I'm going to explain this here in a minute. But the custom. Hallelujah. This was an ancient custom. And the closest thing we can relate it to in our society is the best man. The best man at a wedding, you know, he I guess he's there to comfort the, the bridegroom. Keep him straight. I'd help not to be so nervous. Make sure he's got his tie on straight, you know, make sure he's got his clothes all out of whack. And hallelujah. Make sure he get to the up to the platform on time to get married if you're doing it in the church. Hallelujah. But the friend of the bridegroom. It's, it's different. Hallelujah. Uh, I said, I never understood it all together myself, but as I started studying this out, some things started opening up to me. Uh, the friends of the bridegroom, that's the way they refer to him in the Bible, but he may not even be a close friend. It may not even be somebody he knew before. This friend of the bridegroom I'm talking about. And I'll explain this a little bit. I'm going to lay some foundation here. Many marriages in that day were prearranged by the fathers, and sometimes even as early as while they were infants. In our country, we don't like the idea of prearranged marriages. We, we're supposed to get to know somebody, fall in love, and then you get married, you know, in our society. But in this society, prearranged marriage was pretty well common. And I know a lot of times we think, man, you know, you're a spouse to each other before you're even, you know, grown. What if they don't like each other when they grow up? What if they grow up in the same area and they're bitter enemies? Hallelujah. But the arrangements are made a lot of times by the fathers, even when they're really young. Sometimes even when they're older, there's a dowry that's paid. I mean, in a sense, he is actually purchasing a bride for his son. And uh, that's why... When someone was espoused, like Mary, who was espoused to Jesus, and they thought she had had a child out of wedlock, that was the ultimate crime because she was considered married. That's why Joseph sought to put her away privately because if they thought that, you know, made a big deal out of it, they would have stoned her to death. But now, <clears throat> in other cases, they used the friend of the bridegroom. And I hope to explain this where we can understand it a little better. Okay? Finding the bride. The friend of the bridegroom was supposed to find the bride that the bridegroom wants. It may, it may not be that it was somebody that was already prearranged before they got grown. It may be that it's time for him to get married. He wants a bride and, and he wants her certain specifications. You know? If this man actually found the bride to match the description 
of what the bridegroom wanted, and he was well taken care of. In some cases, he could be set up for life if the man was wealthy enough. Now, I'm on. <clears throat> Let me just for a minute here. I'll do a little illustration. Jeremy, he's not hitched yet. Come here. <laughs> I take it you want to get married. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, now, you want to get married, and you've hired me, the friend of the bridegroom. Well, that's, that's what we got to figure out here. But uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be quite a bit. But now, if I ask you, what do you want this wife to look like? What color hair? What color hair? Dark. Dark. Brown or black? Either one? Okay, dark brown. What color eyes? Green. Green eyes. All right. Uh, what kind of complexion here? You want her to be fair skinned and sensitive to the sun? You want some of this, you know, outdoorsy type of complexion? Okay. Uh, how tall do you want her to be? All right. About that? Okay. Five, 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 six, something like that. Yeah, okay. And uh, you want her to be uh, athletically built or you want her to just be a uh, lay around the house type? That'd be in better shape than me. <laughs> <laughs> right. What size shoes? You want to have big old long feet or, or little feet? Average, average. What is that? Uh, seven, uh, seven and a half. Oh, you like the palm there. Okay. And we, we, he, he describes this bride that he wants. All right? And my job is to go out and find her. Now, he's, he's well paid. You understand? This is equivalent to a private detective going out and finding somebody for you. You're going to have to pay his expenses. You're going to have to pay his eats. You're going to have to take care of whatever it costs for him to go and, and find this bride. All right? And when I find her, if I find her to the exact specifications that he wants, I am handsomely taken care of. All right? But there's a drawback. Because, see, when I go and I find this bride and I bring her back, I have purchased her from her father already. She is espoused to be married. And if I bring that bride back and it's not what he wants, I'm stuck with her. She is to live in my house for the rest of her life as a sister-in-law with me. I am to take care of everything she needs feed her, clothe her, take care of her medical attention. Everything she needs, she lives in my house. I got another mouth to feed, you know. And I don't get paid all this money that I was supposed to get paid. I, I'm not sure whether I have to fork the money for the dowry that I paid for. So I'll, I'm going to make sure that this, this bride is exactly what the bridegroom wants. You can go ahead and be seated. So we don't want to make no mistakes here, all right? Because as the friend of the bridegroom, I want to make sure this is right. Okay? Now, there's some scriptures I want to bring out here. One in Judges chapter 14 and verse 20. I never really caught this before. Judges chapter 14 and verse 20. Hallelujah. But Samson's wife was given to his companion whom he had used as his friend. Now, he didn't know these. He didn't know these Philistines. He chose one out as a friend of the bridegroom to find him a wife. And Samson wasn't satisfied with her. And when he came back, he found out that she was given to his friend. Not, not necessarily friend like, you know, some of us are, you know, a good old buddy, you know, we just... Share things, share to share the life, but they referred to him as the friend, the friend of the bridegroom, and she was sent home to be with him. Now, I don't know if it's legal, if it turns out that they wanted to get married, that they could go ahead and get married, or however the rest of these customs go. I, I looked up some of this stuff on a, in a Jewish encyclopedia and some of these other Jewish nation, you know, information on these customs, and, uh, you know, I didn't really get into what, what, what all happens or if there's any loopholes or ways out of this. I'm sure if there is, then there would be. Praise God. 
But the friend was paid very handsomely for his service. And like I've already said, there were drawbacks. But I want us to notice something. Now I'm going to go to the book of John chapter 15. Something that transpired between Jesus and his disciples. And I never really caught this before either. In John chapter 15, starting at verse 14, and I'll read 15 and 16. He told his disciples, Ye are my friends. If ye do whatsoever I command you. And that's not just to his ministry, that's to everybody. You, know, you are his mother, his brother, his sisters. You, know, you are his family if you do whatsoever I command you. Right? He said, now you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth, I call you not servants. He's not going to call them servants anymore. All right? For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. I, But I have called you friends. They were no longer kept in the dark about what he was going to do. And if you start reading through the Gospels toward the end of his ministry and after his resurrection, you find out that Jesus started spelling some things out plainly to him. And they were asking him questions. He said, it's given to you to know, but they, they're supposed to still be kept in the dark. They were his friends. All right? And he's no longer going to keep them in the dark. So he wants his, his ministry to know what he's doing and what he wants done and how he wants it done. All right? And he said... Uh, ye have not chosen me. Hold on a second. For all, he went on to say, you don't want to keep him in the dark. But he said, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. He wanted them to understand. Verse 16 he said, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit. What kind of fruit is he talking about? A bride. They're supposed to go out and bring in the bride of Christ. His ministers, his apostles. Those that he's called into the ministry. And your fruit, that your fruit should remain. Now, No matter what, you know, as a minister, if it's a minister's job to go out and bring in the bride, the last thing I want is for him to reject this bride when I present her to him. It's the pastor's job, the ministry's job, to present the bride to Christ. And it better be what he wants, okay? He said, henceforth, I call you not servants, but I have called you friends because they are becoming the friend of the bridegroom. You can study your Bible chronologically and from this point on Jesus never refers to his ministry as servants never again will you find this they refer to themselves as servants but you will never again find where Jesus referred to the ministry as servants hallelujah in Genesis chapter 24 hallelujah I'm going to go into something else here praise God another story we know well Genesis chapter 24 and verse 2. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house, it was Eliezer who he's talking about, that ruled over all that he had, he said, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. Now this type of oath is seriously binding. Okay? The oath is very intimate. Abraham is about to make Eliezer his friend. He's no longer just going to be a servant because what he's setting him out to do, he might not even be alive, he's thinking, in his mind, when he gets back. So he's giving Eliezer some authority. All right? He's been over everything in his whole household, but now he's going to make him his friend, and he's going to send him out to get a son for Isaac. Okay? Uh, verse 3 said, And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. He does not want them, his son to have a, a Canaanite wife. Someone that's not of the family of God. God's chosen. Okay? And there's a, there's a lesson there. God doesn't want us looking for husbands and wives 
outside of the church. I know there's some, some situations there and sometimes there's a girl that's interested in a boy and he invites her to church and vice versa and stuff like that. But you better be careful what you're doing. Because there's also a devil out there that's going to do whatever he can to trip you up and cause you to get married to somebody that's going to drop out of church. I'll be honest, when I got in church, everybody everybody could tell. I mean, I had hair down the middle of my back, a big old beard, you know. I didn't look like the average Christian, all right? They knew I was a drug dealer. They knew I'd been on drugs and alcohol. They knew I'd been in trouble with the law, you know. I came to Tennessee to get away from all that. And then after I got the Holy Ghost, it was probably 11 months, and I started trying to date my wife. And Sister Henson told her she didn't want to get friendly with me. And I, I've told the story before. But her concern was, what if that boy goes back out into the world and starts doing drugs again? Then what kind of life has my daughter just got into? So you better be careful because the devil has some plans. You better be sure that you got God's approval in a situation before you jump into something that's going to affect the rest of your life. Brother Mobley preached that message one time. The long-term results of a single decision. We must be careful of the decisions we make and what is going to happen down the road as a result of it. Is this going to lead to good or is it going to lead to bad? Is it going to cause me to draw closer to God or is it going to cause me to fall away from God? Will this affect my children, my wife? You have to consider all these things. And it's done through prayer. Okay? Now finding the, the bride is an important job. So he's sending Eliezer out, all right, and uh, he's binding him with an oath. And in verse 3 he said, I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, the God of earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites. It's important, all right, that we keep things in the church among whom I dwell. And I will make thee swear by the Lord that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites. Why did he say this? Why? Because if you ask God, he would tell you, I hate them. I hate their customs. I hate their gods. I hate their fashions. I hate everything about them. And you remember when I taught on worldliness and carnality. Hallelujah. When God said to be a friend of the world is to be the enemy of God. And there's some similarities here. There's some likenesses here that can go back and forth. And I can put a lot in here right now. But there's no need to. God hates the world. I'm working on another message, the two kingdoms. Hallelujah. Which one are you part of? Which one do you want to be part of? You know, Jesus referred to the devil as the God of this world. That's one kingdom. And he allows that to take place. But Jesus told Pilate, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. Hallelujah. There's a separate kingdom. All right? And it's the same thing here. He don't need to be part of the Canaanite world. God hates everything about him. And if you want to stay in God's favor, you've got to stay away from the things he hates. Okay? Verse 4 said, But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto me or unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Now he's, he's rightly worried about this. This is a binding oath. And he's going off to another country to select the bride as a friend of the bridegroom for Isaac. I'm sure he's got an idea what Isaac wants. But Isaac ain't going with him. And if he comes back with something he doesn't want, he's going to be stuck with it. All right? Plus he has a disappointed master. Right. So, uh, and the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me. Under this land, must I needs bring thy son again to the land from whence thou comest? Praise God. It's no wonder Eloise prayed like he did. How serious he prayed when he got in the well. And specifically, he prayed to make sure he knew it was God's will and the right one. And God answered. Uh, if you read that story, I, I love to read that story. It's, it's an interesting story. 
Praise God. It shows a lot of how God will work in our lives if we'll put into it. But he said, what if she doesn't want to come with me? He said, should I take Isaac back there to marry a wife from the land from whence she come, from your kindred, from God's people? And Abraham said unto him, Beware. Now this is a stern warning. Beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again. Do not bring my son. Now he obviously oh, he didn't want to have some authority here. Okay? Do not bring my son thither again. In other words, don't you dare bring my son, the bridegroom, to dwell among the Canaanites. Hallelujah. God doesn't want us to dwell among the Canaanites. He wants us to live separate from the world. He wants us to be a, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Hallelujah. A bride that's made herself ready. Hallelujah. That is exactly what he wants. And I want you to know that God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. Hallelujah. God sent his ministry to get him a bride for Jesus Christ. And that's our job. Hallelujah. We are supposed to get a bride that we can present to him. Okay? And she must come up out of the world to his level. That's important. Hallelujah. We don't want to drop down to the world's level. The ones that are coming as a bride of Christ need to come up to his level. All right? Live by his standards. Love like he wants them to love. Dress like he wants her to dress. He wants this to be the bride that he has chosen. And he's given specific instructions on what type of bride he wants. That's why we study the Bible. To show ourselves approved unto God. Hallelujah. I want to be the bride that he says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Or maybe not a servant because you're the bride, but you understand where I'm coming from. I want him to be pleased with me when that time comes. Hallelujah. I'll be honest, saints, I want to tell you probably the biggest problem with Christianity today, across the board, all right? The biggest problem with the church is today, people are trying to bring the church down to the level of the world. That's what happens. If we're not careful, we got to keep the standards raised. we got to keep, you know, things the way God wanted it to. It, it's a hard job to keep things at an original pace from one generation. You know, place from one generation to the next. All right? But uh, people are trying to bring church down to the level of the world, and God is not pleased with that. Hallelujah. He hates the God of this world. He hates worldliness. He hates carnality. Hallelujah. He don't want us to think like the world, to act like the world. He don't want us to dress like the world. There ought to be a noticeable, noticeable difference between his bride and the world. Hallelujah. We need to study the scriptures, and that's important, to show ourselves approved unto God. But we need to study these scriptures until we know what God loves and what God hates, what makes him mad, what makes him glad, hallelujah, what makes him sad, hallelujah. And it's definitely not patterning after the world. These things don't make him happy. Now, to many people, they want to lower the church down to the level of the world and it's a dangerous situation. Instead, we should be saying, I'm going up higher. I want to get up closer to God. I want to know what makes him happy. I want to be uh, a delight in his eyes. Hallelujah. Now, people want to live like and do whatever they want to do and say whatever they want to say and still say, I'm part of the bride. But it don't work that way. I got news for you. It does not work that way. We've got to be separate from this world. And I know a lot of people think crazy. And I think a lot of times apostolic preachers, you know, go too far and they've got too many rules and regulations. But you got to understand that I'm going to present you a bride to Christ. And I do not want him to reject you. For your sake and for mine. Hallelujah. I don't want to get there and him say, you caused this one to be lost. And they say, well, you know, you know, 
You know, there's so many rules and regulations, and I thought the same thing when I first got into apostolic church. I thought, man, that's crazy. They just got so many, you know, guidelines and stuff like this. What's the matter? You know, and it's something, a voice just checked me and said, if you want to make it to heaven, are you not willing to do everything you need to do to make it? I'm telling you, when it comes to the point that I present a bride to Christ, I want him to go, whoa. <laughs> This is much more than I expected. She is much more beautiful than I expect. Hallelujah. I want her to be happy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Too many people want to lower the standards. Hallelujah. But it's not going to work that way. You're either going to be part of the church or part of the world. You can't, you can't straddle the fence and be part of both, both places. We are a bride that must come up to his standards. If you think he's coming down to yours, it's not going to work. And we might have some misunderstandings about things in the Bible, but we can pray and seek God and make sure we are coming up to his standards. It's not all the minister's job, because I can't go and police everybody. I can't go and make everybody do anything. You know what I'm saying? But I can tell you what the Word of God says, and it's my job. The Bible tells us, if I tell you, to tell them something. This is in Isaiah, the watchman. He said, and you don't tell them, they're going to die in their sins. And their blood will I require at your hands. I want to get it right. He said, but if I tell you to tell them something, and you tell them and they still don't listen and they die in their sins, then their blood's going to be on their own head. They're still going to die in their sins and be lost, but you will be free of the blood of their souls. Hallelujah. So I want to live, hallelujah, like God wants me to live. Hallelujah. Don't get, like I said, don't get mad at the preacher, the friend of the bridegroom, that is supposed to present you a bride that matches his specifications. And that's why we got to study. Hallelujah. I want to be a bride. You know, there, there might be some things that I, I say sometimes. I have preferences. Uh, some of the standards are back biblically. Some of the standards are because I want to make sure. Hallelujah. I want to make sure there's no discrepancy. I don't want to see anybody get there like Brother Cockrell used to say. And uh, find that the Lord says, one thing thou lackest. I'd rather get there with a whole truckload of things and the Lord laugh and say, man, there's a lot of this you didn't have to do, but well, welcome in. I want to be welcome. I'm not going to complain if he says, you've done all this that you didn't have to do. I don't care what I did after this place is over, after this life and this world is over, when we go home to be to him, with him, and then nothing else is going to matter but being there. I made it in. Hallelujah. I want to be saved. You know, presenting the bride is the job of the pastor. And a lot of people don't understand this, but it's plain as anything can be in the Word of God. If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, hallelujah, and verse 2, <clears throat> this was Paul, who was the, the apostle to the Gentiles, hallelujah, and a lot of what he's dealing with is because he's dealing with Gentile nations, and their customs were different. But he's telling him, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Well, why are you jealous over me? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's preached to them. He's helped them grow. He's watched them, you know, change. Filled with the Holy Ghost. And baptized in Jesus' name. And seen them just grow into a beautiful creature for God. He said, but I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. That's his job, to present them to Christ. A preacher, you just preach too many standards, too many guidelines, you know, more than I think you should, and that's all right. I've been there. I've felt like that. But you got to understand, what I'm doing is I'm trying my best to make sure there's not one person in this building that doesn't make it. That is my main concern. 
I don't care if you have to walk all over me or whatever happens, but if I can see you make it to heaven, ready to meet God, I'm going to be happy no matter what. Hallelujah. There's times I lose sleep. I stay up night crying. I get up sometimes in the middle of the night and go pray. And, uh, you know, I don't know what to do. And sometimes when I'm done praying, I still don't know what to do. You know, sometimes you just got to pray and leave it in God's hands. And sometimes we have trouble with that. I got this problem, Lord, and I need to do something about it. And you don't need to do something about it. Sometimes you need to lay it on the altar and leave it there and quit coming back and picking it up and trying to take it up again because all I'm going to do is make a mess out of it. If I want to give it to God and say, Lord, handle this, I don't know what to do, and keep praying and seeking God and fasting and whatever you have to do, and let God take care of it. Hallelujah. He can do more, hallelujah, than you could ever imagine. It's one thing if God says, do this or say this, or go here, go there. And I know a lot of people don't realize. I was talking to Jason Roberts the other day, and he's talking about preachers in different churches and stuff like that. And then the preacher says, and I, I told him, I said, one thing you better remember, Jason. If an apostolic preacher tells you, thus saith the Lord, you better take it to heart. Because it's not like anyone else. An apostolic preacher, there are some, don't get me wrong, Brother George hated this. He wrote a track on this. Of this name and then claim it. You know. Command ye God. Tell him what you want. No, it doesn't work that way. If God tells you something, you better tell it. Or you're responsible for not telling it. I'm going, that's what the teacher tells you, the preacher tells you, thus saith the Lord, you better take it serious because he is. He's not saying that unless he is absolutely sure God said it. And I had to learn as time went on that I don't need to put my extra two cents in. You know. I didn't say exactly what God said and nothing else. Afterwards, I can kind of say what maybe I think or this or that, but but what God says, it needs to be exactly what he said and take it serious. Praise God. Because it's our job to espouse you to one husband. Hallelujah. And, and there, there might be guidelines and standards that I preach that might not be necessary. You know? I can't believe you said that. It can be. But my whole purpose is to try to make sure beyond the shadow of a doubt you're going to make it to heaven. It's like I said before, and I got into wanting to study about getting mushrooms. Anybody ever want to gather mushrooms? You know, I started looking at the book, and, and to this date, the only one I ever try to gather is a puffball. Because as long as it don't have a stem on it, and you cut it open, and it don't have gills, it's a puffball. They come in several different shapes and sizes, textures, but it's a puffball and it's safe to eat. But the slogan on the front of the book said, there are old mushroom hunters and there are bold mushroom hunters, but there are no old bold mushroom hunters. You don't take the chance. It says, when in doubt, throw it out. Hallelujah. And if I'm not sure, I'm going to say go to overboard. I'm going to say go the extra mile. Hallelujah, because I want to make sure that some things aren't spelled out. You're not going to find, thou shalt not smoke a cigarette in the Bible. You're not going to find that. You know, thou shalt not, you know, smoke marijuana. You're not going to find that in there in that way. The Bible does teach us about defiling our temple. Hallelujah. And we got to be careful of some things. There are some things in the Word of God that are preached because of godly principles or biblical principles. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And someone said, well, I, you know, I'd much rather present a bride <laughs> to the bridegroom than have him say, wow. You know? I don't know. You know, dads are kind of funny about boys <laughs> wanting to date their daughters. <coughs> but there is a certain pride there when a boy looks at your daughter and says, Wow, she is beautiful. That's my girl, and you better watch it, boy. <laughs> Hallelujah. You don't want, want anything going on here. Hallelujah. And I'll be honest, you know, my daughter, I tried to tell her some things before she got married. Joke about scenarios, things like that. Trying to get her to realize that we weren't just mentally. And sometimes you got to lay the groundwork ahead of time. Praise God. But I want to see the children saved. 
I want to see him make it in heaven. You don't always know what's going on down the road. Hallelujah. But I do know this. If you go at it prayerfully, no matter what happens, it don't matter if the devil gets in the middle of it, nothing is going to stop God, his providence. If God says something is going to go a certain way, it don't matter if the devil managed to kill Jesus. You know? Or didn't kill Jesus. God's purpose was going to be manifest one way or the other. There's no way to stop it. It will come around by another route, but it will it will still, his purpose will always be performed. Hallelujah. And he loves you, and he wants you to be saved above all else. Hallelujah. So in closing, hallelujah. If you would, Brother Jeremy, let them know I'm fixing to wind this up. But in Genesis chapter 24, which we've already read this from Abraham, we read down to verse 6. And this is verse 7. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred. This is Abraham talking. And from the land of my kindred. And which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed I will give this land. He shall send his angel before thee. God definitely did. And thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. If you would come to the music. Do you, do you realize, and this is really what I'm getting at, church, do you realize what would have happened if Rebecca had not come up to Isaac? This is symbolic. If the bride did not come up to Isaac, Abraham and all his seed would have lost their inheritance. They would have lost Canaan. He was dwelling in Canaan land. And that was his inheritance. If Isaac had went down to Rebekah, the inheritance would have been lost. Hallelujah. And if we're not willing to leave the world and rise up to his standards, come up to him. We'll lose our inheritance first. We've got to make sure it's right. Praise God. Stand with us. I want to love God. I want to serve God. Whatever it takes. Hallelujah. We're study to show ourselves approved. Hallelujah. I want to be saved. And I want to see everyone in this building saved. Hallelujah. That's my main purpose. Hallelujah. Praise God. Lord Jesus, have your way this morning. Let us just get our mind on God.
this morning.
his arms are wide open to take you in. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, hallelujah. We feel sometimes that we're unworthy, and we are. But he loves us anyway. Praise God, he loves us anyway. Thank you, Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus is the best thing that I have ever all stand. Praise God. I uh, enjoyed service. I love the spirit that I felt here, Lord. Praise God. Minister to each and every one of us. Hallelujah. Let us feel the love, Lord. Your arms wrap around us. Praise God. Well, I guess we can take our Sunday school report. We talked about when uh, Samuel anointed David. Yeah. Okay, praise God. Hallelujah. Well, let's all pray, and we'll be dismissed in Jesus' name. Lord, we love you, Jesus, and thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We ask you, Lord, to touch our hearts and our minds, Lord. Help us to make ourselves ready, Lord, to be your bride. Thank you, Jesus, for all you do. I ask you, Lord, to keep your hand of protection about us, Lord. Keep your arms of love around us, Lord. Let us ever feel your presence. Lord, no matter what we're going through, no matter what situation, help us to realize that holding on to you, Lord, and your love is the best thing we've ever had. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise God. And we can be dismissed in Jesus' name. Praise God.